Aloha, everyone. So have you ever wondered, as we did, what it took for extraordinary people around the globe to improve access to education, to make slavery illegal, to increase rights for women and children, decrease infant mortality, or eradicate smallpox? or what it took for global leaders to create the United Nations, the largest peace-building organization on the planet. These are amazing feats, and they did not come easy. So what did these engineers of social, political, and humanitarian change have in common? Well, we believe that they all had skills and courageous and creative peace building, that they had the courage and the commitment to continue even when challenges seemed really insurmountable, and they had what we call the critical seeds of peace planted around them when they were young. So what are those seeds of peace? When we looked at local leaders, national leaders, and even global leaders in peace building, we discovered that the critical skills that they take with them to be effective all start with the letter C, hence the seeds of peace framework. They include um, critical thinking and courage, conflict resolution, collaboration and compassion, commitment and community. And we divide these into three categories, the seeds within, the seeds between, and the seeds in service. We feel like it's in the constellation of seeds that you find true peace building. As someone who's a strong critical thinker might not have the courage to make that first step, or someone who is full of compassion, but lacking in critical thinking or conflict resolution skills will feel much, but not be able to do much in the way of problem solving. And our goal is to raise resilient peace builders, resilient leaders together. Oftentimes the words peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace building are used interchangeably. But what is the distinction? Peacemaking is about the diplomatic resolutions of a particular conflict in a particular moment. Peacekeeping involves military intervention, when we bring the military in to help stabilize an environment so that peace building can happen. And peace building is a systems approach to change. It's about looking at our political, economic, and social barriers to peace. It's about transforming relationships and addressing the real root causes of the problems that we face in our communities. And of the three, peace building is the most difficult, obviously, but also the most essential and the most enduring. Uh, Peacemaking and peacekeeping are not going to last very long in terms of its, their effects without the factor of peace building. And while it's important for adults around the globe to learn these peace building skills, if we really want long-term solutions, we have to raise new generations of peace builders. So let's take a look at what the Seeds of Peace equation looks like in practice. I'll share an individual example, and Maya is going to share a national example. This is our beautiful Aunt Janet. She was driving down a rural Wisconsin road when the next thing she knew, she was laying in a hospital bed recovering from massive surgeries and massive injuries. She had actually been hit by a train crossing a railroad track when the bars were broken. It took her about a year to recover, and after that she said to me, you know, my perspective on life has so radically changed. She said, I realize that I have one purpose on this planet, and that is to make sure that for every interaction I have throughout my day, whether that interaction is with the grocery store clerk, the mailman, my husband, my grandchildren, that that interaction has made their day a better day. And she said, I realize every interaction matters. And so she wakes up in the morning with that intention. So I challenge all of you to try that. It is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, she then took that purpose with her to her kindergarten classroom, and she altered the ways that she engaged the, the five-year-olds as they entered her classroom, how she integrated peace-building curriculum into her daily curriculum with the children, and even more importantly, how she inspired them at the end of the day to leave her classroom and be those sowers of seeds, 
um, in, her, in their own homes, even as five-year-olds. And the good news is, you guys don't have to be hit by a train to learn that lesson. <laughs> so let's take a look at the seeds equation around, well, against the backdrop of a massive atrocity like the Rwandan genocide, which claimed nearly a million lives in 1994. Changes in Rwanda in the two decades since have required the most challenging forgiveness imaginable. Conflict resolution structures and courts, reconciliation commissions, and a commitment to move forward together as a community. And perhaps most importantly, peace has required the presence of conflict resolution in schools so that young people change their views on identity and no longer think of themselves as Hutu or Tutsi, but simply as Rwandan. It's this 360 degree approach that has made Rwanda a peaceful country today. So what do we mean by a 360 degree approach? This is really important. We know that children are impacted by adults in their homes and in their schools and in their communities. But if we're only building peace building skills in adults in one of those areas and not in all three, when children move from context to context, they end up getting mixed messages. So for example, if at home we're teaching our children that hitting um, is not appropriate and is actually a form of violence, but yet when our children go to school and they misbehave and they're met with corporal punishment, their moral compass is going to be pointing in two different directions. Or if at school they're taught to value diversity and have compassion for others, but then at home are told that the neighbors come from elsewhere, don't belong because they're different, they'll be confused and the lessons in compassion will not be fully learned. So we have made progress, but we still have a tremendous amount of work to do. Let's take a look at some of the barriers to peace we have here in Hawaii. We have unresolved indigenous rights issues. We have the seventh highest poverty rate in the nation. We actually top the national average on domestic violence homicide rates per capita here in the state. And we have about 4,000 reported cases of child abuse every year. Globally, there's currently 37 armed conflicts going on. 195 million children have stunted development due to malnutrition. And we have approximately 2.5 million people trafficked every year, 80% of them women and children, for sexual exploitation. These are really complex issues, but they're preventable and they need to be confronted as a curable disease. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we normalize peace building and move our goals beyond some flimsy, utopic abstraction to something real and achievable, though admittedly difficult? People still think of peace work as wearing a t-shirt with a peace sign on it or sitting peacefully under a rainbow. But this is really hard work. It requires that we challenge what we think we know about ourselves and others, that we be willing to be uncomfortable and make enormous sacrifices. And you know, that's not to say that sometimes it's, you know, it is important to mobilize around symbols and to conjure references to nature and tranquility, but we will fail to make real progress in peace until we rebrand peace to be seen as a necessary action, a necessary process, a necessary way of being, and a curriculum. The AB seeds of peace, if you will. So that peace building is seen as fundamental core, essential as teaching students reading, writing, and arithmetic. And it's extraordinarily important to have hope. Uh, we have made progress. Uh, if you take a look at Steven Pinker's research, he has spent decades looking at violence and dehumanization over the centuries. And he concluded that as a human species, we're actually making really good progress in terms of becoming more peaceful. If you look at some of his most recent research about the United States, 
From 1970 to 2010, we have made great strides in reducing the rates of rape and homicide. Or globally, the number of countries that are moving from autocracies to democracies is increasing exponentially, which is really good news, because we know that in democracies, there tend to be greater human rights laws in place, and therefore more just societies. But in order to keep making progress, we have to have some tools that we can use every day. So let's explore some tools that we can use to plant the seeds within, leading to more critical thinking and courage. Borrowed from the work of Peter Elbow, the doubting, believing, and sharing game can be used with any controversial topic or perspective. A student first doubts, which means she challenges and deconstructs that perspective. Then she believes, which means she absorbs it and defends it and supports it. Third, she shares, which means she finds her own position, drawing from both sides or finds the point of intersection between the doubters and the believers. And the purpose of this activity is to ensure that we're using critical thinking to help students keep their minds and spirits open and flexible. The doubting and believing game can be used at home as well when we work with our children to understand the complexity of issues like genetically modified organisms. Um, a very hot topic here in Hawaii. Uh, and looking at the pros and cons and anywhere in between, um, it helps build their critical thinking skills around what the deeper interests and consequences are. Um, we can also do the Doubting and Believing game when we're reading with our children by going deeper into the characters, all the different interests of the different characters in a story so that they understand the story in a richer way rather than just reading the words. Now, ethno-mathematics is math that makes us think more deeply and feel compassion towards others in our community. We can use graphs, charts, and algorithms to understand the challenges of economic inequality or the role of poverty and war. Community and uh, business leaders can show young people the pathways to social entrepreneurship. And at home, we can discuss with our kids the effects of a tourist economy or build empathy in them by showing the difficulties of moving from homelessness to stability, uh, security, and shelter. Let's take a look at some of the seeds that we can plant between conflict resolution, collaboration, and compassion. We'll start with the pohaku bowl. Pohaku means stone. And you place a bowl in a central location in a family, in a classroom, um, or even in an office. Everyone in those communities has their own stone that sits around the bowl. When issues come up for them that they want to discuss, or when they're feeling really angry, rather than throwing the stones at each other, they choose to put that stone then in the bowl. And that indicates for everybody that there's an issue to discuss. That bowl is then brought to the next circle time at school, the next family meeting, or even the next staff meeting. And the issues are brought up one at a time. Not only does this allow for a safe way to bring up issues, but it also puts a kuleana on the community to help come up with the problems, and or help come up with the resolutions together so that they have ownership and buy-in on what those resolutions are. Another tool is the peace rose. And we use this oftentimes with children, but I think it's even more effective with adults, although we often don't use it. Um, but it's a way for children to learn how to problem solve themselves without relying on the adults to intervene when they have problems with each other. It's a tangible object that gets passed back and forth. The child that's holding the rose is a child who is sharing his or her feelings using I statements and feeling words. The child that is listening is practicing his reflective listening. Um, and we've done this with two, three, and four-year-olds. The rose is passed back and forth until they can communicate through the conflict, until there's an, we always say, um, sincere apology is achieved. And then the steps moving forward are identified to make sure that that conflict um, doesn't continue. We've heard from a lot of families who their children have had this lesson in their school that even in the family, even for the little ones, if there's family members that are arguing, the children will run up to them and say, hey, you guys need the peace rose. So you see how it's a really useful tool um, used at both at school and at home. 
Let's take a look at some tools we can use to plant the seeds in service, leading to greater sense of commitment and community. Cast the Net is a way to explore subjects like history or current events from many vantage points. And it's a good way to bring perspectives from the margins to the center. A student studying the American Revolutionary War can speak, write, read from the perspective of a patriot soldier, a loyalist mother, an Iroquois child, a slave or an elderly mill worker. And what are their various perspectives and how are we enriched by knowing them? We cast the net, in other words, to bring in many stakeholders. And this has the added benefit of helping young people understand the ripple effects of causation and interconnectedness so that they become more inclusive in their problem solving in community, both locally and internationally. And another tool that helps promote commitment in community is what we call paint and post the future. And this is about bringing people together who are in conflict, adults and or children. And they then co-design what that preferred future looks like for them. And this can look different depending on the group. It can be a painted mural that shows visually what that future is with all the stakeholders identified in the picture. It can be um, shared values that they all come up with and they're listed and oftentimes designed with beautiful art around them. Uh, it could also even be a logo that represents for them what that shared vision and shared future looks like. But the important part is that that shared vision is shared in a communal space that is able to be seen every day as a reminder. So at schools, we'll see them outside school buildings, um, in classrooms, even in the children's notebooks inside their front page so that they see that every day. At homes, it can be on the front door as a reminder as you're coming in and out, um, or next to your dinner table or inside your living room, so that when conflicts erupt, that shared vision always, is always that reminder that we need to back up and problem solve our way there, reminding us of our shared commitments. So we're going to close today with a really powerful story of a young, resilient peace builder named Malala Yousafzai. In 2009, um, at the age of 12, she was blogging for BBC under a pseudonym, detailing her life under Taliban rule and sharing her opinions and ideas about education for girls. Three years later, she was boarding her school bus in the northwest Pakistani town, when soon thereafter, a man boarded the bus. He asked for her by name. He then approached her and shot her three times in the head. Astonishingly, Malala survived, and despite of the fatwa against her, she spoke at the United Nations and called for worldwide access to education for girls. She continues to inspire social movements and policy reform worldwide. So we have to ask ourselves, what does Malala have that gave her that courage to mobilize millions of people for that cause? She has the seeds within that gave her the power and the courage to speak out under the most repressive of circumstances. She had the seeds between that highlighted for her the importance of collaboration to make sure her agenda was advanced. And she has the seeds in service that gave her the commitment to her life of meaning and purpose and for, the girls, for girls worldwide. Imagine if we were able to raise the majority of the 133 million babies that are born every year throughout this world as peace builders, the profound impact that would have on our communities. Peace building is teachable. Please believe that. Please. You know, it's our collective responsibility now to help families, communities, and educators rethink the ways that they model for and teach children. And we can do this. 360 means each and every one of us making that impact every day. We know that peace building feels overwhelming at times and we feel tired and distracted. But we hope that you have a couple new ideas to start 
or resume this work in your own communities. And we hope too that you believe as we do that it is possible to shift social norms and make the future more peaceful. Um, it's up to you now, beautiful people. What combination of seeds will you plant with the children around you? Thank you. Thank you. Mahalo. Mahalo. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Mahalo.